currently working with the scaled up innovation at Bayer. Uh, so uh, with Strategizer and AFC, and we do the basically the execution bit where we pro provide experimentation as a service. And uh, we also kind of scale up the uh, later on the MVPs and taking the product market fit for the ideas which are selected for the for uh, basically they kill 70% after experimentation. So we just keep 30% up for market launches. So uh, good news is we have created now, at least that's what buyer tells me that it's now 1 billion euro portfolio they've created uh, in the last four years as a new revenue channel, which is a good success story to sell. <laughs> Please, I need to invite you as a, as a speaker. I can see that <laughs> already. <laughs> all right, all right. Who, who else wants to say hello before we start the, the session today? Hi, Gary. Hi, Leandro. Hi, Jordan. Hi. Hi. Hello, good morning or good evening. All right. Okay. So I think we we can start in today. We 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 are proud to have here uh, Professor Tobias Gutman. Uh, Tobias, just to simplify today, uh, and I think we are going to learn a bit more about corporate venturing, um, which is really important in the post COVID nineteen world where every single company is strugg struggling. Uh, uh, to, to recover from the crisis. Others are not struggling or are struggling for a different reason because many are also uh, probably more successful now because they were able to, to, to provide services or even more services they were providing before, before the crisis. But depending on your burning platform, I think corporate venturing is always a, a, a key topic. And I was quite excited when, when, when I was uh, scrolling on browsing on, on LinkedIn, and I'm, I've seen a post from Tobias Goodman, very well structured, that explaining the different flavors and types of corporate venturing. So I've decided to invite him in, uh, and that was successful. So thank you very much, Tobias, to, to, to give us one hour uh, uh, of, of your time. But I, I will leave it to you maybe to introduce yourself and then feel, feel free to start the, the, the presentation, and then we move to Q&A, okay? Thank you, and thank you all for being here. Perfect. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks for spending the time with me. Uh, it's my first time at the uh, Innovation Cafe, so I, I'm pretty excited. I'm based in Munich in Germany, so it's uh, seven uh, like in the evening, and I prepared for you some slides or some stories and also some, some kind of input on corporate venturing. Uh, but before I do that, let me introduce myself to you shortly. Uh, so I'm an engineer by training uh, for the last almost 10 years. I, I, I spent uh, with Siemens. I did different stuff there, uh, business development, strategy, innovation management, uh, partnering with startups, and for the last three years in corporate venture capital. I have a PhD in strategic management. So in my uh, PhD thesis, I looked into corporate venturing programs. Um, over the last, I don't know, four to five years, I spoke to more than 150 companies about their corporate innovation strategies, their corporate venturing uh, mechanisms. And uh, today I will present to you some insights actually from my PhD thesis. And uh, I'm like pretty excited. It's one of my uh, like topics I'm very passionate about. Um, now from like since four months, actually, I'm an assistant professor at EBS, European Business School in Germany, and uh, I will give you an overview of what I'm doing there. Let, let me quickly bring up the slides which I prepared for you guys. Can you see that in full screen mode? Give me a short heads up, please. Perfect. All right. So. Today's topic, corporate venturing, how to design corporate venturing programs. Uh, before I start with this, let me quickly talk about what I'm actually doing in my professorship. So it's not just uh, being a professor and doing teaching and research. Actually, what I uh, am doing there is I'm heading and managing the Siemens Product Innovation Lab. So it's sponsored uh, by, by Siemens and in very close collaboration with Siemens Advanta. And uh, so the big uh, thing we're doing there is we're trying to be the interface between kind of different industry leaders, different corporates, different companies, between academic researchers and students. And we're trying to ask or to answer the question, how can you build market relevant products and services um, to, um, to accelerate innovation? 
And we focus there on the, the early phases of product uh, development, which is, of course, uh, the hardest and toughest. Uh, we have different focus areas, but actually, like my day to day business now is we focus on teaching. There, we, of course, equip our students, our partners with different tools in the innovation space. I do a lot of research in the innovation management area. We also, as an institute or as a lab, uh, collaborate with different corporates, different companies where we do uh, projects and in. In a win-win scenario, I combine my research with the consulting projects or kind of the studies we do with our partners. Uh, additionally, we do executive education. So we recently uh, established a new master's program in digital transformation, where we also kind of partner with Siemens to deliver a, a course on the basics of digital transformation uh, and so on. So that's kind of my, my day-to-day life. It's a pretty pretty cool setup. Uh, so my operating model is very entrepreneurial. I do research, I do teaching, I do a lot of engagement with industry leaders and kind of uh, it's not just that I'm sitting in my ivory tower and doing research. I try to be very, very close to, to the industry and be a trusted advisor to different companies. But today I prepared to uh, like prepared different aspects like in my agenda i first of all want to do a, a little baselining on corporate venturing so that we're all talking about the same topic then i will introduce to you a corporate venturing framework which hugo just mentioned and then uh, i will give you some practical examples from the industry where other companies uh, like how they organized their corporate venturing activities and uh, i think at the end we have a lot of time for q a if that's all right with everyone, I would start off with uh, point number one, baselining. So, of course, as an academic, <laughs> you always need to start with definitions that we all talk about the same stuff. What is corporate venturing? If you ask uh, like 10 people, 10, you're going to have 10 different opinions. Uh, some think it's only corporate venture capital. Some like, uh, like have different opinions on it. Uh, like in general, even if you see the different academic definitions, which I don't want to read because, of course, you're going to have the presentation afterwards. Um, but if you take a look at it and what is corporate venturing, let's define it as all the corporate mechanisms which accelerate innovation and new business creation. So when you take a look at kind of your company where you do corporate innovation or corporate venturing, you have accelerators, you have company builders or venture builders, you have a venture client model, you have corporate venture capital, you have intrapreneurship, hackathons. You see there are thousands of different uh, modes and they all fall into the kind of the big area of corporate venturing. And over the last couple of years, there have been a lot of uh, changes in the corporate venturing landscape. So I, um, like I have three different examples, which kind of should illustrate to you uh, what has happened over the last couple of years. Let me start with Allianz. I think you know the company, a German uh, insurance company. Um, they started off in 2013 with the Digital Accelerator, which was a uh, kind of a typical startup accelerator where Allianz as a corporate partnered with um, startups. Then, in 2016, uh, they established Allianz X as a company builder, which means uh, kind of like Rocket Internet back then, a, a venture builder where they came from ideation to exit with a very rigorous process. But actually, uh, in parallel, they also had digital corporate ventures, kind of their corporate venture capital arm, where they invested in strategically relevant companies. And then in 2017, kind of a big bang where they merged their venturing activities into one unit, the now operating model of Allianz X, which is a corporate venture capital firm, which is a pillar of their digital transformation strategy, where they invest big tickets into strategically relevant companies. So you see there some changes going on. And later on, I will also give you some examples uh, um, explaining kind of this going back and forth between different venturing modes. Uh, so. Uh, keep close attention to the Allianz company where I'm going to give you some uh, like interesting explanations. But second, uh, uh, second example, Axel Springer, so a German media house. Uh, they were one of the first in Germany which had a accelerator program. So the plug and play uh, accelerator. Also a program where Axel Springer as a company partnered with different companies, but they don't, didn't just partner with them. They also had a very small equity stake. Later on in 2018, they partnered with Porsche, uh, like 
you know, the mobility uh, company, uh, Car OM, um, and they partnered to have a joint program, an early stage investment company called APX. And you see also very interesting dynamics. A German media house is partnering with a mobility player. Uh, so very interesting setup, very interesting market dynamics there. And last but not least, Telefonica. Also interesting example, uh, you know, Telefonica, the telco company, um, one of the longest living uh, kind of accelerator programs, the Vira, uh, very, uh, very interesting kind of startup engagement program. And they used to have a very traditional accelerator model where they partnered with a kind of very early stage companies. Uh, they also had a, um, a equity stake, a small equity stake, and they partnered with those companies to also provide a lot of coaching, a lot of resources, uh, mentoring, office space, and they tried to connect them with the, the Telefonica company as an intermediary. But actually that didn't work so well. Also one of my research projects back then was to help them facilitate uh, or change their model into a venture client model, uh, which I'm going to explain later on. Uh, but in 2018, they changed from this accelerator model where they partnered with them and had an equity stake with uh, kind of early stage companies to a venture client model, which means uh, they look for much more mature startups on a later stage and they facilitate the engagement and the sourcing, um, which means that the Telefonica becomes a client of um, the startup technology. So a little different uh, goal uh, and a kind of an incremental change uh, in their strategic setup. So you see only in those three examples that it's not just the new program launches uh, uh, about corporate venturing, which make the news, but actually the relaunch and kind of the uh, trial and error uh, mechanisms of those, of those corporates. So that was kind of the impetus of my research where I was asking what's going on there? What's, what's actually happening there? Why are they changing? What's happening there? And I try, tried also to make sense of all the different formats because we have company builders, we have CVCs, we have accelerators, venture clients. You see a lot of different uh, modes or a lot of different mechanisms. And I try to make sense of them. How can you actually bring them kind of together in a framework and have a definition of what is actually what corporate venturing mode. And then that's already my next point. Uh, I'm going to introduce to you a corporate venturing framework, which I published, I think two or three years ago, uh, but now I can talk about it and I'm happy to introduce to you. So I was asking, how can I harmonize different dimensions and different modes, uh, both from like theory and from practice? And uh, so I looked in, uh, into the academic research over the last like 25 years, and I tried to make sense of uh, how are scholars looking at corporate venturing? How do they, uh, like, which lenses do they take to investigate um, the phenomenon of corporate venturing? And uh, I identified seven different dimensions. So for example, they differentiate between the locus of opportunity. So is it an internal venturing activity or an external activity? They have different objectives sometimes. So is it rather strategic or financial? I think uh, you're all kind of innovators and very familiar with uh, kind of uh, innovation theory. You all are uh, familiar with the ambidexterity kind of from strategy uh, research where they differentiate between exploration which means uh, like new business creation and exploitation. Exploitation is of course the, uh, the optimization of the current core business, but even more like the, how is the link to the corporate firm? Uh, do you invest or do you not invest? Is equity uh, uh, part of it? And of course also the innovation flow, like is it outside in when for example, you partner with a startup that innovation flows from the outside to the inside, or is it inside out? For example, if you have a company builder or an entrepreneurship program, where kind of innovation is flowing from the company outside to the market. So you see, uh, if we analyze the different dimensions, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of different dimensions, there's a lot of uh, kind of a mix of uh, different views, and it's very hard to grasp uh, kind of what is actually kind of a, a holistic uh, mechanism of corporate venturing. And so what I did is I tried to harmonize all those dimensions into this framework. This is the one which Hugo mentioned in the beginning. So on the, I have a three by three metrics, which is uh, very easy to reach. I think uh, it's a kind of a consulting framework also, where on the X axis, you have the direction of innovation flow, which I already mentioned with inside out and outside in. 
but I also established the inside in view, which means if you're a big corporate, a lot of times innovation is flowing from the inside to the inside. So from one department to another department or from one region to another region or from one business unit to another. So you also need to take a look at the inside in view. And on the Y axis, you have the prioritization of objectives. So uh, when you ask the question, what is actually the objective of the corporate venturing unit? Uh, is it rather strategic? Uh, or is it rather financial? So you, you pursue primarily or predominantly uh, financial objectives, then it's on the, on, the, on the bottom. And of course, you have balanced objectives, which means you have both strategic and financial goals at the same time. And with this grid, you can like set up this three by three metrics. And I will go, not for all of them, because we don't have so much time, but for example, of course, the Internal Explorer, uh, those are corporate venturing programs uh, like a idea challenge, an internal hackathon, uh, where you, for example, trying to uh, access the, the ideas and the innovation potential of your employees, and which is, of course, an inside in uh, innovation flow. And it's rather strategic because uh, the time to impact also is very, very long. But you internally explore kind of the potential of innovation of your organization. And that's, for example, the internal explorer. I think you all know entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneuring also a uh, very long time to impact. You work on uh, long-term shots. Uh, you work uh, in a department sometimes, sometimes in a, uh, uh, under the CTO or in a, in a specific dedicated unit uh, to work as an entrepreneur on kind of new business of the company. Uh, but uh, I will give you some examples later on. Uh, also, when I have this uh, framework, I harmonize the, the other dimensions, which I mentioned in the beginning. For example, I can differentiate between, is it an internal opportunity or is it an external or so internal mechanism or an external mechanism? And also, as I mentioned, the ambidexterity concept, I can uh, differentiate between, is it exploration or is it exploitation. So you see, I, I try to harmonize the different views and I have a, a nice little framework which I can use now, which we can use now to make sense of corporate venturing and also the different corporate venturing modes. Uh, but now maybe you ask, why is this relevant for you? Why is it relevant for the scholars, if you're kind of uh, interested in uh, academic stuff, but also why is it interesting for practice? And let me give you some examples there that we uh, can you familiarize, familiarize yourself with the framework. So let me talk about the external explorer. So the external explorer is an outside-in uh, corporate venturing unit with the, which pursues like primary strategic goals. And uh, an example there is the BMW startup garage. Uh, I think you know it. Uh, also, startup collaboration units, venture clients, uh, corporate accelerators, they also fit into this, uh, this, this exercise. So it's a unit where you externally explore new, unit and new innovations and you try to partner with it. The, I call it strategic because uh, like the time to impact also is very, very longer. And uh, uh, you don't always pursue financial goals uh, with this. Sometimes you want to access new innovations, you want to have another window on technologies. Uh, so you have different goals. It's not always just uh, like financially driven. That's why it's rather strategic. Uh, from an academia, of course, the corporate accelerator fits into that. I will give you later on an example of SAP, how they do it. But you know the corporate accelerator, which is kind of an intermediary between the corporate and the startup. It's kind of an outside in open innovation program where the startup gets kind of access to resources, uh, sometimes funding, uh, kind of also the, the brand credibility of the corporate. And the corporate accelerator kind of is trying to uh, bridge the gap between the startup and the corporate world by uh, kind of bringing those together and having a very structured program where the corporate accelerator screens and selects startups and at the same time gives this kind of collaboration structure to the startup and uh, with facilitation services like mentoring, networking, uh, coaching, and so on. So I think that's, that's pretty basic. So I don't want to go deep into this. Uh, I will later have some, some much more practical examples. But the venture builder is kind of is one of the venture uh, modes which is on the rise, uh, where where we see currently a lot of corporates trying to experiment with this uh, this one. So it's a balanced objectives. So you both have strategic and financial goals. It's inside out because you're trying to do as a company builder, venture builder, startup studio, different names for it. You're trying to excubate or to spin off new businesses. 
And one example is uh, Bart X from Fisman. Uh, Bart X from Fisman, uh, here a little overview. So it's a, a, a venture builder of the German heating company Fisman. Uh, so the German heating manufacturer, for example, and they have a kind of their focus on deep tech products and companies. Uh, they have a very rigorous venture building process from discovery where they identify problems, where they go into ideation, trying to, to look for solutions of those, uh, those problems. They prototype them and then they build ventures. Um, uh, last time I checked, they had five ventures and maybe they have even more right now. So, but there you see, it's really kind of a spin-off factory focused on a specific problem. In this case, how can you build deep tech products and companies, which kind of are also strategically very relevant for uh, the mothership. So that's one example. Um, um, there are even more, of course, uh, a lot of consultancy firms now focus on, on helping companies to do joint ventures with them and building companies from scratch. Uh, last but not least, let me just focus shortly on the strategic investor because it's also a very prominent example of corporate venturing um, and corporate venturing strategic investor, the typical CVC, corporate venture capital unit. Um, also, some accelerators fit into this uh, example is BASF. Uh, also, uh, like all, all the CVCs you might, might know, because usually they both have strategic and financial goals. Some of them, of course, are rather financial, so they might may be on the lower end of the spectrum. But even those who say they fi finance, uh, like usually focus on only the financials, they also invest in strategically relevant fields. So that's why that's uh, the CVC parts there. Example, and we already mentioned it shortly, Allianz X which is kind of the digital investment unit of the Allianz Group, which as part of their uh, digital transformation strategy, invest big ticket sizes into strategically relevant companies uh, in different fields, for example, mobility, connected health, data intelligence, and cybersecurity. And they already have invested, I just checked, I think two days ago, they invested in on five different continents, uh, 23 direct investments, and they have a, a fund of $1 billion. Uh, 1 billion euro. Uh, so very interesting. That's kind of one example uh, of a strategic investor. And so this was kind of the introduction of the framework. And now let me let me give you some examples of big corporates, uh, how they organized kind of their venture strategy, their different venture modes uh, in kind of a similar vein, uh, kind of which can be rep represented in such a framework. So for example, uh, let's talk about S uh, Allianz, uh, about SAP and about FISMAN, which are companies where we already touched upon shortly. So uh, we talked about Allianz in the beginning, where I give you this overview of how Allianz changed over time, uh, the prominent examples. So they started off as the Allianz Digital Accelerator, uh, which is an external explorer mode in 2013. But then, of course, if you're and a big corporate and you want to do it as part of your digital transformation strategy then it should have an impact on your operating model it also should have an impact on your uh, pnl statement because it should move the needle on a balance sheet but of course if you only partner with startups sometimes even with uh, kind of early stage startups uh, you won't have you won't produce kind of that large-scale transformation impact and they also figured that and they changed their mode in 2016 to Allianz X, the venture builder, where they try to build companies from scratch. So it was a strategy shift. But actually, I think you're all familiar with it. If you're trying to build a company from scratch, it takes a lot of time. So in order to move a needle on the balance sheet, it takes I don't know, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years. So you need to have very long-term and patient capital. And uh, it seemed like, from an external view, of course, it seemed like this wasn't the right venture mode for their objectives, namely to be part of the digital transformation strategy. So they changed again in 2017 to become a strategic investor. And I already explained to you what it is, but it seemed to me again from an outside perspective that the board was quite happy with this transition because in 2019 uh, they uh, kind of they mm, proposed or they mentioned that they want to increase the fund size to a $1 billion uh, 1 billion euro because they have a very good investment record and they're quite happy with kind of their large scale impact of the ventures they invest in. Prominent examples are, for example, N26. I think you're familiar with it. Very good company. Bima is a very good company where they 
part, they not, not just invest in the company, but they also partner with them and trying to kind of have a joint development or joint go to market with those uh, scale ups. So you see also here in this, uh, especially in this case, um, if you know what your goal is, uh, you also should figure out what is the right venture mode to kind of uh, which fits the objectives. And if you don't do it, uh, it's very unfortunate, of course, because you don't just spend a lot of money or you don't just burn a lot of money, but you actually lose so much time. And this is crucial for all of your businesses. So you see in this example that uh, be aware there are different venture modes for different goals and you should kind of fit, uh, they, they should fit uh, kind of uh, each other. Uh, next example is SAP. Uh, SAP, I think you're all familiar with it. Uh, they also have a portfolio of different corporate venturing modes. This is a, an example which we published in 2019. This was a case study from one of my master students who kind of took a look or he investigated the SAP Startup Accelerator, which was a very good program based in Berlin, where they focused on the digital supply chain and they, they looked for startups which they can partner with uh, and do a joint kind of go to market and partner really SAP and the startup bringing them together in a, in a very, I think a, a 12 week program. And it was quite successful because uh, after 12 weeks, uh, I think two or three of the startups already partnered uh, kind of uh, with the company and later on, almost all of them had a, had a close partnership with, with the big corporate, which is, uh, which is a very good success case. But you see, when I start on the right side, venture capital, they have uh, Sapphire Ventures, which is their independent uh, venture arm. They have the Accelerator. They have also Startup Focus and they have SAPIO. SAPIO uh, is kind of, uh, has different goals. They have a kind of a, a fund where they invest in companies, or early stage companies, but they also have a venture studio, which is kind of the company builder or the um, uh, venture builder, however you call it. They have an entrepreneurship program. Also, they have an innovation department, uh, kind of the innovation center network. And of course, also, this is also all aligned with internal activities, which is kind of the standard product development, product management, uh, kind of incremental innovation in, in the SAP units. Again, it's a very, very good example where a corporate from a strategic perspective uh, asked, how can I organize my different venture units into kind of this uh, holistic uh, view of corporate venturing? And last but not least, give me an example of uh, Fisman, the company which I mentioned with BudX. They also tried to experiment or they experimented with different venture uh, modes, uh, depending on the velocity of change in their industry and also on how many, like how deep insights, tech insights do you need uh, for it. And so on the upper right corner, you have but X, the company builder, which I already mentioned, but they also have V2 Ventures, uh, kind of their venture, um, in, like the investor. Um, they also have Innovation Boiler, which is their uh, startup partnering unit. Uh, they have a um, co-working space. Uh, and now they're trying to consolidate it into kind of one unit. But also you see a lot of different venture modes for different reasons aligned in one strategic uh, kind of framework. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. So, and also discuss with you kind of how, uh, what examples do you know? And uh, what do you think of this uh, approach? What do you think of my framework? When I go back to my framework again, uh, what do you think of it? Do you have any examples there? And if you're a strategist or if you're an innovator uh, or you're a CEO, whatever your role is, I think uh, a takeaway here is, first of all, corporate venturing can be broken down into nine, nine different modes. Uh, so that's the first one. Second, um, you need to make sure that the mode you choose fits your purpose or your objectives. And third, you need to make sure that all those venture units get orchestrated. So you see, uh, usually when you take a look at big corporates or at, at all the companies which have different venture units, they are very siloed and there's not much synergies between them. So you try from a strategy perspective, you need to try to orchestrate them into kind of an end-to-end -end venture, uh, venture process and a venture organization where you make use of all the knowledge which is going on there. For example, if you're a strategic investor, 
then your day-to-day -day business as an investor is to take a look at uh, uh, startup companies, to evaluate companies, uh, to have a, you have a very good market understanding. You sit on boards of companies, so you're a trusted advisor of, of uh, kind of gate ups maybe. Uh, and all this kind of knowledge you have there, this also should kind of play a role, for example, in your internal activities, because those people are very good kind of sparring board as sparring partners for internal ventures or for internal ideas. So you, try, you should try to connect um, uh, all those, those different units and need to orchestrate it. But there is no one size fits all approach. So every, every corporate has a different culture, different capabilities, different resources. So uh, if you organize your venturing activities, just make sure um, there are different units, there are different modes, uh, there are different goals, and you should come up with kind of a holistic strategy uh, you don't need all of them, uh, of course, depends on the size also of the company, but this gives you a blueprint also for discussion on which venture modes out, uh, are there and which one do you need, which one may, maybe do you do not need. <laughs> and uh, it also should give you an, an kind of a, a language where you can discuss the plethora of different venturing modes. And uh, so you can like have your own co-venture strategy the right way. And with this, I'd love to kind of close my, uh, my talk today and love to uh, kind of discuss with you in the Q&A. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or on Twitter, and uh, I'm happy now to answer all your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I think it was uh, very, very good because we have a, we have a structure where we can clearly clearly understand uh, where an organization is. And sometimes that's exactly the problem. It's very hard to find an, an organization where we walk in and we clearly understand their innovation strategy or even their strategy. But in what regards innovation, usually when we ask, oh yeah, we do hackathons, uh, design thinking, service design, uh, we run workshops. And, and, and that's it. Then only a, a few, you know, one of those few are listed on your presentation, mm. are in fact doing this in, in, in the proper way. And then there's a, a large group of companies where they don't even understand the question, what is your innovation strategy? And they think, yeah. okay, um, ask the CTO, because they think innovation strategy is their technology strategy, okay? So depending on the maturity level, we have clarity or we have the opposite. We don't have clarity at all. And I think your approach is a tool. It can become a, a canvas, a bit like strategizer with what Alexander did with the, boss, with the business model canvas was to simplify the language and everybody can play with the business model. I think what you have here is something equivalent, but to the corporate venturing world. But I, I will leave it to you guys. So feel free to, to, to unmute uh, uh, and share what you think and ask questions to Tobias. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi, uh, Narjit here. So uh, interesting examples. Apparently I've been working with some of them as well. So uh, by the way, Alliance also did entrepreneurship uh, program for three or four mm -hmm. years. Uh, we, we were actually supporting them. So. Uh, but the whole picture you gave me now give me a whole 360 degree view of what they were <laughs> trying to do. But interesting. Uh, so one question is, uh, how would you define uh, success for these these programs? Like I was giving you a number because from my perspective, it's just a vanity matrix from my perspective. But like, how do you how would you say that uh, this program is successful or the other program is successful according to the of course the goals which they set up in the beginning? So yeah. Yeah, very, very good point. Uh, there is no one answer. Uh, who in the beginning mentioned uh, it should be a canvas or so. So I also, like if we uh, closely collaborate, I also have a canvas for corporate venturing, like how to design such units, um, because there are different design parameters to do it. And uh, one parameter is also, of course, uh, kind of the success criteria, like how do you measure success, uh, kind of what's the performance of those units. And uh, you break it down, there are strategic performance goals and financial performance goals. Every mode has different performance goals and uh, it's also also very uh, uh, individual depending on kind of what are the different goals also from the board or from the CEO. Um, of course for example if you're a uh, strategic investor so you have both strategic and financial goals um, there there's something like for example the IRR, cash on cash like the different financial uh, performance goals um, 
and strategic goals also depends very much on, on your stage or on your goal in general but it could be something like uh, how much revenue do you uh, create with the, the startups you invested in how much partnerships did you facilitate with those companies um, uh, how much revenue did you also kind of uh, produce for your startups or induce to your startups? So it's both both, both ways. Um, so there is no one answer. Uh, I know uh, the question I get a lot. So I, I really should work on a slide where I do different KPIs for all the venture units. Uh, so in all the interviews I, I, I did already or conduct, conducted, I always ask the question like, how do you measure performance um, in the venture unit? Uh, how, how did you also change the way you measure performance because uh, they changed over time? because they'll get more and more professional and know what to measure. Um, but uh, the takeaway there is you need to measure performance. <laughs> and if you don't have a real kind of also a long-term impact, at the, at the end it's, it's about money and uh, kind of like in the future, uh, uh, even the strategic ones in the, in the, at the end of the day, in like five to 10 years should create money because it's about business and surviving. Um, so at the end, you need to have a right measurement tool to, to measure performance and you should have a vision of uh, how, how to materialize that. I don't know if it answered your question, but uh, for, for all the different dimensions, all the different modes, I can give you hundreds of different KPIs by the end of the time, like what are the three KPIs uh, to make it a success? And uh, you as a, an, a designer of those units, you make sure it's both strategic and financially and that you kind of measure it the right way. Yeah, cool, thanks. Thanks. I think we have a question here from Gary. I, I, like, if I can add there, I, I think I the, the, the same talk I did this week, and the same question came, and I um, I asked, answered a question in a way that I know my first interview I did uh, in the venture space uh, I don't know, like f five years ago or so, where I ask eventually, which is not there anymore because <laughs> clearly it it died. I asked the CEO, "How do you measure success, and how you define success?" And he told me, "Toby, this." very easy there are only two metrics of success and that's how i measure them it's uh, uh trust and happiness you know very <laughs> I said, oh my god like <laughs> are you serious huh? but actually it was serious and of course they died you know because if you don't have a clear vision of like how to like how to add value to to your company uh, then you're destined to fail another yeah. answer would be paying salaries in taxes that's how we measure <laughs> <laughs> But this is one of the top reasons as well why innovation accelerators and all these fail because uh, the expectation from management probably is on the ROI with X, which is more on the exploit side. Uh, rather, they measure, take the KPS of exploit and try to kind of build it an explore side, which doesn't work. And uh, yeah, this is kind of, quite, kind of uh, a question which, as you mentioned, that it comes every time. It's kind of a difficult one to answer. But then, totally, yeah. totally. Of course, like the KPIs in the exploration phase, they need to be different than in the exploitation phase. But in the long run, uh, you know, th th there's a switch. You know, you start off with exploration and then you have this transition, uh, the scaling up phase, where you then come into uh, later on the exploitation phase. Right. But you, that's why you need to have an end-to-end -end process and the end-to-end -end understanding on how you get from your exploration portfolio later on to the exploitation portfolio. Absolutely. Thanks. There's a question here from Gary. Um, the framework looks very useful and practical. In my experience, this works if and only if you have full buy-in from the CEO to the point where actually he is pushing for it. If it is bottom-up approach, it is doomed to fail. Would you agree? What's your experience? Yeah, so both in the research, but also in also consultancy work. You know, if you take a look at uh, the studies from Boston Consulting Group, who do an amazing job there um, in the co-venturing space, uh, there's always about kind of what are the, the key success criteria um, of co-venturing, and it's always C-level commitment. Uh, especially like if, if you need to commit an innovation, it needs to be uh, kind of, of course, like in the, in, the, in the operations, it needs to be both top down and bottom up. But if you don't have the commitment from, from the top, then it's destined to fail, especially if you do investments uh, like all the other innovation activities. Innovation is always hard because innovation means you destroy something and uh, you take away uh, like work from somebody else. And so if you don't have the seal of a commitment, uh, then uh, it, it doesn't work. And actually, uh, even one step higher than that or one meter level higher, like uh, Corporate venturing or corporate innovation uh, needs to fulfill a purpose, and the purpose needs to be kind of led or given by by the management or by the CEO, because like he's again, he's the guy who's leading the, the, the company into, into into a future. So if the, the the CEO doesn't have a clear entrepreneurial vision of the future, 
uh, then you don't have a roadmap for, for success of innovation because you don't know where you're heading. So the CEO and the top management team is crucial there because they, they lead you into the future. They, they should be the guys kind of uh, empowering uh, and equipping all the, the other guys to, to make their job in innovation and also kind of help them to do that job and kind of uh, eliminate roadblocks on the way. Thank you very much. Any any more questions? Yes. Um, Go ahead, Jordan. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good 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 afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Jordan. I'm innovation program manager at Expresso Senegal in the Middle East Africa. Expresso it's a telco company. We are data and voice uh, with uh, value added services provider so since 2018 we, we launched we, lo we are launching open innovation strategy in our context and we will we will want to uh, use a, a corporate venture model to to create a genuine new new business and to target the next core uh, business and we can use this model to increase our business value and our descriptive potential. So I, I have just one question for, for Tobias. Why corporate venture building is the best model for, for, for descriptive innovation? Did I say that? That's another question. Did I say that? Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's, it's always the right model. So venture building first is a is a tough game. So you need to uh, have the right people, the right processes uh, in, in place, the right governance structure, all that stuff uh, to to make it a success. Um, especially like if you do it for the first time, uh, I wouldn't recommend to do it. I would uh, like uh, advise you to have a trusted kind of company helping you to do it because a lot of times uh, uh, it's like you need to have a total different mindset. You have total different skill set uh, to do uh, kind of venture building and doing it for the first time also comes with a lot of hurdles uh, on, on many different levels. So um, I think there is no, like if you want to innovate, like if you see corporate venturing as kind of one tool in your corporate innovation strategy, uh, my suggestion or my recommendation is not to only focus on one uh, venture unit of venture mode, for example, venture building, but you actually need to, to have kind of a portfolio of different innovation vehicles and also especially on, on different venture modes, because then uh, you can realize innovation on different levels on the organization. Because at the end, it's kind of also a numbers game. If you only build one venture, you know, it's like if you do a venture builder and you maybe have three or five uh, companies which you spin off, then it takes like, five to 10 years that uh, they will kind of actually uh, produce very good revenues. But actually also if you compare to other startups, uh, like if you build 10 companies, uh, maybe after 10 years, only one survived. So if you bet your future on venture building and only, only this mode, I would uh, be very afraid uh, kind of of the success or the future of the company. By the end of the time, by the end of the day, you need to have uh, an orchestra of different instruments in the innovation space and you need to make sure that innovation is happening on different parts of the organization in different places and uh, you don't just bet on only one idea or only one uh, unit. Does that answer your question? Many thanks. It's good. Marta, you were trying to ask something? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, so Tobias, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Nice, really nice uh, framework. Uh, but honestly, I think it's a very German uh, perspective on the innovation, which makes me suspicious because honestly, I'm also based in Germany and I didn't see any very innovative company, let's say in Germany in the last five years. This is my personal opinion, very personal. And that's why my question, because um, you were mentioning, I think it was uh, a question from, so the first question that of course we have to measure everything in terms of like, it's not only about spending money, it's about the success. So at the end of the day, what counts is the financial success. And in your presentation, I was missing a little bit and maybe it's just my understanding. Okay, what was the success? You were mentioning Allianz was spending 1 billion euros 
and okay your timeline stops 2018 i don't see any success so honestly for me if i should if i will make the financial evaluation will be like okay guys so what's on the end uh, then you mentioned the cooperation between porsche and i think it was uh springer exactly um, okay, what's at the end of the day? You spend guys a lot of money. Same with Wisman. And on your presentation, I've seen like they spent 2.3, correct me if I'm wrong. And at the end of the day, they have something like a functioning digitalization model. Um, SAP, if we compare them and see the beautiful portfolio, uh, I can only think about HANA 4, which is honestly not really innovative. And that's why I'm wondering, okay, it's really nice thing. Okay, they did a lot of great stuff tried to not to spend too much money but where's the success and i'm just my question to you is really like okay uh, is there any success or it's just like um we still hope for the success mm -hmm. how do you see the things yeah uh, well, i totally agree with the thing it's a, it's a german thing because i'm a german and of course my thinking is uh, boxed and i, I think <laughs> in structures and matrices so i would say of course the framework is uh, biased by my German thinking, but actually as a strategy perspective, and I try to, 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 to bring structure into kind of strategy, uh, then in my research, I, I took a look at like many, many companies from all, all, all like from, from US, from, from Europe, from Asia. So I, uh, it's not limited to kind of the German region. So that, that's first. Uh, second, of course, the examples uh, I chose there, they're mostly from Germany because uh, I, I did a presentation uh, in, in term, Germany back then. So, of course, but I could do a lot of uh, different other companies who have similar, similar um, kind of projections or changes over the last couple of years. Um, to the point of success, um, in every mode, I can name like many, many success cases. But as always in innovation, uh, uh, you need to, like at the end, the measure for success is also throughput, like how much do you, do you spend, uh, like put in, how much do you get out. And a lot of times it's very inefficient because uh, that's how also corporate functions. And uh, I also see a lot of like those venture units. Depend, it doesn't matter if it's a CVC or entrepreneur, venture builder or a startup uh, collaborator. It's, uh, there are uh, companies which are doing a very, very good job uh, for example, Qualcomm, uh, they invested also using Zoom here. So they invested, invested in Zoom, uh, which of course is a very financially, very, very good investment. Uh, but then you also have um, like, uh, we're talking about entrepreneuring, you take a look at Sony. Uh, um, the Sony PlayStation came out of inter inter entrepreneurship uh, activity. Uh, so there are a lot of success cases, but also there are very, very, very much failures. And uh, a lot of times we always talk only about our failures. Uh, but uh, innovation is a, a tough game. It's, it needs to be very professional. Uh, Hugo in the beginning, I think, mentioned uh, people uh, like try to um, delegate innovation to a, to a person, like the CDO or the CTO or anything like it. At the end of the day, you can't just delegate innovation to one unit or to a person, to only one venture unit. It should be part of the DNA of the company. And those units should be kind of the front runners in promoting innovation, innovation culture in those companies. But uh, I'm totally with you, of course, uh, a lot of times. That's why we also talk about the so-called innovation theater, because those units are very poorly set up and uh, not really well connected to the whole innovation strategy and also not staffed with the right people. Um, that's why a lot of times uh, those venture units um, do a very, very poor job because uh, it's not, they're not really designed and not set up for success. Does that answer the question? Um, I would say partially, maybe another question will clarify it. Um, why are you, the, let's say, differentiating between the strategical and the financial one? I just don't get it. You know, on the matrix, on the Y axis, you have like in the bottom, the financial one, the strategic one. Uh, why? I'll give you an example. Uh, and on the top down, in the middle, there's the commercializer. The commercializer um, is a very good example at Siemens. It's the Siemens Technology Accelerator. And the purpose of the Siemens Technology Accelerator is to commercialize um, existing resources or IP, which doesn't fit the core anymore. So for example, uh, Siemens spending uh, billions, uh, 1 billion every year on R&D. And a lot of time R&D is uh, kind of, uh, IP is developed, which doesn't fit to the core business anymore of Siemens. So you can shut it down 
or you're trying to make money out of it. So you can commercialize it, you can spin off a company, you can sell it, you can license it. So there are many, many different ways on kind of trying to, to innovate around it and to have a clearly a financial goal to commercialize IP. Yeah, don't have any strategic goals because you just want to get rid of it, but you want to, can, can make money out of it and it can be very, very profitable business. So there you only have a financial goal. Also, when you take a look at financial investors, like on the bottom, on the down right, uh, there are um, a lot of corporates, um, they, for example, have big pension funds. Uh, and uh, what you do with the pension money, uh, you're of course trying to make money out of it. So you invest it in different uh, asset classes. And sometimes of your investment strategy, you also put the money into private equity or venture funds. And so there you have kind of financial investors only in it for the financial reasoning, but they actually also have kind of good ties to the venture industry. So um, if you orchestrate it correctly, those kind of networks and those information and those skills, they can also be very helpful in the, in the strategic investment space. So there you only actually have one financial reason, not a strategic reason. Does that answer your question? Um, interesting point of view, yes, thanks. Yeah, but of course, uh, if you have big corporates, then there, there's a, a chance to do it. If you take a look at like, small and medium-sized companies, a lot of times they don't have such, um, such venture units. That's what I mean in the beginning. Uh, it's not a, like, if you're a corporate uh, a, a company, you don't need all of them, uh, but some, some do. Also, the exploiter, which is also only a financial one uh, on the bottom left, uh, uh, I currently work with a company that have like, uh, more than 50 different venture units. So it's not really, <laughs> really efficient. So an exploiter program is kind of a, kind of a, a consulting program where you're trying to make your, your venture strategy more efficient and you try to align the different modes and you try to streamline your whole venturing processes on a, on a corporate level. So you only do it for financial reasons because it's very inefficient. You know, I was just wondering, like, if I'm thinking strategically, um, anyway, I still want to make some money out of it. And the first impression was like, okay, you're suggesting basically, as I said, impression, like if I'm going only for strategical reasons, I'm not, there is no, let's say, idea of making money out of it. And that was probably confusing okay. a little bit on the, yeah. on the why okay. basis, but okay, if it's still like, okay, I want to make my company bigger, I want to introduce new products, new services, whatever, it's more the strategical one. Now I got the point, the financial one is basically, I just invested yeah. my money yeah. somewhere, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, and like it, buying it, stocks it, or whatever. Or if it's, if it's strategic, it's kind of, it promotes your survival. So it's always, it's, it's need to be profitable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other one is just to make money. Let's say I have some savings. I want to invest like in the corporate stock or whatever. Okay, got yes. the point. Okay, yeah, but uh, good point. Yeah, maybe I need to be clearer on the definitions there. Thanks. Thanks. Very good. We have a comment here from Duncan. Do we not need to reconsider what we value as success? Financial success is only one vector. It's a very good comment. Say uh, again. Uh, Say again. Uh, if financial success is our, is the only definition of success, if we should not consider other definitions of, su of success, happiness, sustainability, uh, many other uh, vectors, not just revenue and PL type of stuff. Um, question here from Gary. Um, no, but from uh, Gary, I think. In my, daily, in my daily life, I see R&D as a real problem for innovation. They are fully focused on the core business. How can they innovate then? You need to pull the R&D guys out and give them the right incentives. So is R&D part of the problem? Is it something we need to reconsider? Well, at the end, of course, R&D a lot of times is very much incremental because it goes hand in hand with uh, kind of the product development departments. Sometimes it's also horizon two, horizon three. So that depending on, on, on your R&D strategy. But at the end of time, uh, a lot of times uh, R&D should be complemented uh, with corporate venturing because then you have an open innovation strategy. Because also you need to ask yourself, how can you open your R&D process, uh, processes to kind of tap into the kind of the innovation potential outside of the company? Because uh, like there's this nice quote, uh, like saying, uh, no matter how, how smart you are or how much money you have, like uh, there, are, there are gonna be much more smarter people outside of your corporate boundaries. Right, thanks very much. Dario, if, if you can unmute yourself and ask the question. If you can't, I can, I can ask. I, I would try my best. My internet connection uh, doesn't work too good. 
So thank you, Tobias, first of all, for the presentation and for the insights. I hope it works now with the camera. Yes, we can so, hear you and see you. Yeah. Yes, perfect. So basically, the question I was asking to myself is, if I'm forming this new corporate venturing vehicle, who should form the team? Who is part of the team, first of all? So it's an internal people, it's an external people. And then the second question would be, who are the, all the different stakeholders that are relevant for pushing forward this corporate venturing vehicle? So you already mentioned C-level commitment, so top management commitment, but there are many others, so yes. Yeah, very good question. It also depends on the venture mode. Um, if we take a look, for example, at the external ones, uh, the, um, for example, the CVC or the venture client or accelerator, um, there, uh, it always depends on, of course, also what your goal is there, but uh, it should be a good mix of internal and external ones. For example, if you invest in companies, investing is a skill set which is rarely kind of in, you rarely have in the company because you need to come from a kind of institution or a very good top tier financial investor to, to be a very good investor. But you also need to have kind of buy in from, from, from the corporate because if you kind of come from the extra from the outside, a lot of times you don't have the credibility. Uh, the people they don't like you, people don't, I don't know. <laughs> so you always need to have one person, kind of usually somebody who's a credibility inside the company, both on the top management level, but also uh, kind of in the lower ranks, uh, who is able to kind of navigate the complex structures of the big organization. So it should be a kind of a, a good mix of a, an external guy bringing the outside view and kind of an internal guy having the credibility and kind of the experience in kind of doing such a change management process. Uh, there's no one size fits all approach uh, because a lot of times also internal people are very, very good and have a lot of good examples and experience. Um, so uh, it depends very much also on the culture and uh, of, the, of the corporate. So, uh, but uh, I really like, advise to have both like internal and external uh, staff. Uh, also, kind of the question on how far they, they need to be, uh, or how far they need to be away from the, from the business depends very much on, on the culture of the organization. If you put it too far away, uh, sometimes uh, kind of uh, you, you build stuff uh, which can't be transferred anymore to the corporate. Uh, and if it's too close, uh, you might be too biased uh, to have kind of radically new ideas. Huh? So it's pretty tough. Uh, but the stakeholders, uh, like in every, like de depending on the organization, but uh, my my view is very much based on corporates, like big, big corporates. So it's not on small and medium-sized companies. And in corporates, it's uh, like every endeavor is very, very much political. So from a stakeholder perspective, you have a very complex stakeholder metrics from like uh, regional people, divisional people, um, R&D guys, uh, sales guys, marketing guys. <laughs> like it's, it's such a complex uh, organization you need to know. That's why you need to have this kind of old gun, right? the guy who can, navigates such complex things and knows whom to involve and whom not. So uh, that's what I recommend um, to kind of play the, also the, the corporate game. And uh, sometimes if you need to accelerate decisions, then you need to come up with kind of the plan that a CEO is just giving you, uh, providing you the way, going the way. Thank you. Carlos, you want to go ahead? We can't hear you, Carlos. You are unmuted, but the sound doesn't go through your microphone. I well, still can't hear you. Maybe your laptop mutes, uh, is on mute. On yeah, I, I can ask the question. How about mm -hmm. small, middle ICT groups? Uh, can we apply the Venturi, the Venturi framework as well? Okay, yeah, good question. Like, as I mentioned, uh, of course, that's very much uh, corporate driven, uh, but uh, I see also a lot of uh, good, small and medium-sized companies who have a, a very good uh, co-venturing strategy, or venturing strategy. And there, of course, uh, you don't have so many resources and so big uh, kind of programs like in big corporates. But also there I see, especially in the investment space and the partner uh, in, in the startup collaboration space and also in the kind of the internal activities, a lot of good programs, a lot, a lot of good activities where small and medium-sized companies uh, like paving the way for, for such venture strategies. And sometimes it's even easier because uh, decisions are much more faster and kind of taken by, by the top management team, which are uh, very close to because it's a small and medium-sized companies. But there, of course, then you need to make sure that uh, you have the right people on board to, to actually have an impact 
especially if you, for example, do investing or partnering, you do make sure that those people have the right skills, you know, like doing the scouting, do a due diligence, do the, do the, the processes, right? Uh, so there it's also tougher because you need to, can need to be able to attract this talent. So you need to have a very kind of attractive uh, offer or a setting environment to attract the right talent for, for a job. I hear a little, I hear, but I, I can't, I can't really hear you. Okay. Okay, we can try lip reading, but it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> Just one question, uh, probably. Uh, so I think the bigger goal of uh, innovation usually is kind of for the CEO is like digital transformation of the complete company, not just like the you know, new business model, but also the core business model. Do you have any examples where, I know Microsoft did it, but do you have any other examples where the knowledge flew back to the core and then it kind of resulted in the transformation of the complete company, so to say. Have you seen those examples as well? If I have an example where the digital transformation already happened or where they- Or it's basically more like the, the whatever kind of processes and uh, things you learn in the innovation side, because innovation kind of is a silo as well, if you think about it, that came mm -hmm. back into the core business and then the actual transformation of the company happened. Yeah, like take a look at a whole company level. That's a, that's a difficult one. Uh, like uh, there are not many where I say, okay, that's uh, of course there are a lot of like the, like there's this examples of Hilti and so where they come change their their whole operating model from kind of a uh, the whole business model. A lot of times it's about business model innovation. There are very right. good examples. Hilti is a very famous one. You mentioned you were strategizing, so you know it. Uh, also in Germany, we have this uh, Klöckner company, like the, the, the steel. Uh, manufacturer which kind of transformed from selling steel on a b2b level like kind of offline into yeah. uh, to an online version but there are some examples um, but actually like the whole transformation uh, uh, I, I don't have any good answers there mm -hmm. that's a good one I need to do my homework there <laughs> <laughs> good thanks Yeah, thanks for the questions. I hope uh, like uh, the the whole framework it helps you. Uh, it, it's all published, so um, it, I can send you the paper or the, the material if you like. So reach out to me. It's also going to be online, so you're going to have the, the kind of the video online. But uh, I'm happy to kind of uh, give you more insights, and if you kind of want to engage with kind of also my professional role as a professor and as the Siemens Lab, we also help uh, or uh, like companies to, to do it, to engage it. We have a lot of more tools, not just venturing, we have the whole kind of uh, product development phase from a technical aspect, operations aspect, organizational aspect. We do a lot of stuff there. So happy to uh, to engage there if, if I can help you. It was an exciting presentation, Toby. Th thank you very much. And by the way, I invite you all uh, to uh, follow us on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. That's how you guys can- We do. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and take a look at the last presentation because um, our guest uh, called Mark, I think he said that he doesn't believe at all in what to be is just shared. <laughs> so <laughs> it's good. <laughs> uh, that's why I really love this project because we, we challenge each other, but we are, yeah. we are friends, we are teammates, let's say. And what yeah. he said is, I don't really believe in corporate innovation. So just let, let the, the core business die and start something new. Forget about it. Forget about corporate venturing and all of that in hackathons and blah, 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 blah. Start something new from scratch and let the core business die. And I told him, how many times do you tell that to a CEO without getting shot? Or because it, it's really hard yeah. if you're working in an organization. Or I, as a I don't believe it because if you take a look at companies like Siemens, like, uh, of course, I'm very biased, but Siemens has been around for like 180 years. And uh, it, it was able to reinvent itself all the time. So uh, it's very profitable company, very innovative company. And uh, they, they, of course, a lot of times they also sold some, some of their core business and all that stuff. And they reinvent themselves with innovation, with also, of course, with M&A and other stuff. Uh, but there's an example of big, big old companies who were able to reinvent themselves over time. And uh, it would be very sad. Uh, like, if you, of course, as a CEO, you also have the responsibility on, on a very social side, uh, kind of to, to provide jobs and to help people thrive, uh, kind of give them purpose and meaning in, in, their, in their kind of professional life. So I think it would be very sad if you only would say, uh, okay, I let them die, I do something new. It would be not a kind of entrepreneurial and uh, I would say purposeful uh, leader. 
Yeah, I mean, what, if I can jump in, what I took from Mark's um, remarks last week was that the institutional and psychological requirements to succeed within a corporate were exactly the requirements that would kill any attempt at innovation. So his prescription seemed to be create a giant skunk works outside the company, whereas this is all about what you do within the company. Um, and I was sitting there thinking of all the reasons why I couldn't see what Mark was doing. I just couldn't see it would possibly work. But then I found myself watching this going, and I can see all the reasons why he would say what he said, because I can see why this wouldn't work either. So yeah, it is, uh, it's a fun challenge. I would agree that okay, innovation is tougher in the boundaries of a corporate uh, than kind of the external market as a startup. But uh, there are a lot of like examples where it works. And I think you as an organizational designer or strategist or CEO, you need to make your homework, do your homework and kind of provide that environment. Like, you know, when I, there's a very nice example of, uh, from 1985, 80, 80, uh, a framework on what you need to do in order to do venture creation. And uh, it's actually four things. It's uh, uh, the, th the things I take a look at, it's kind of the people, uh, sorry, the process on the organization. Those are the hard factors, you know, you need to, to, to have the right innovation process, the right uh, kind of governance structure. But then this, uh, the other two things is the, the, the individual and the environment, which means you need to have the right individual, the, kind of the entrepreneur, the un entrepreneurial person who wants to solve a problem. And you need, as an as CEO, as, a, as an innovator, as a, as a boss, you need to provide an environment where those people those individuals can thrive and can innovate. And it's your job kind of to, to provide that, that environment from yeah. incentives, from an organization, from a cultural, from different dimensions. Uh, but if you kind of uh, design your organization in a way uh, that those four things are in line with your culture and your purpose, I think, uh, then you set up for success. Yeah, and of course it's difficult, it's difficult. Just your, no, nobody said it's easy. <laughs> and just your point of view, I think, yeah, um, one of the, you know, the, the characteristics that an innovator has to have in a corporate company is that resilience. Because at the end of the day, you know, nothing will come free to you if uh, you are in a big, you know, type of company where innovation mindset is not really like uh, the remits, the original remits. So you really need to push and prove it work. Um, and fortunately, I had the, you know, I was fortunate enough to work with Ugu and uh, to drive a bit of that mindset where I am at the moment. Uh, and uh, I, and I, just to give you my, my two pants, I think there's a, a book that is very good that it's like a Bible for corporate innovation. It's called The Corporate Startup um, of Established Companies that Can Develop a Successful um, Innovation Ecosystem. Sorry. And uh, I think it, it's more impossible. And in the book it talks about the Google and Amazon example, how they keep reinventing themselves, you know, in, in this ecosystem. So uh, to kill a product in the corporate innovation doesn't, uh, in a big company doesn't, Makes sense. You have stakeholders. You have to respond to. You have clients. You have suppliers. You, have, you 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 feel like a bit like sort of ecosystem of uh, of people that you can just say, oh, let's well, you know, it's part of my French foot this. So uh, it's just how you create that from the top bottom, and uh, and 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 I think that's possible. Just a matter of continue being resilient, continue being entrepreneur, and uh, and drive the culture, uh, you know, culture and change in the, in the the way you do things. And as you prove with results. You know, it's a matter of time until we get more people on board. Yeah, good point. Hmm. One final question, because we are running out of time. And, and that's good. There's a lot of excitement here. <laughs> you won a, a match between Tobi as a, a fight club thing between Tobi and in, in Mark. That will be fun. <laughs> <laughs> no final questions? Okay. So I guess we are done for today. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure to be as Thanks a lot. This was a, a, a keynote lecture. It was a class. So it's like going to the university and, and learning a lot about uh, corporate venturing. Uh, and guys, I hope, hopefully we'll see you next week. Okay, we have another, another guest. Uh, and feel free to uh, jump into the Slack channel and participate in, in discussions or start a discussion. Okay. Thank you so much for kind of inviting me and you. also the, the cool discussions. Uh, see you soon on LinkedIn or in the next uh, sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Igo, for your engagement. I'm, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Here. Thank okay. you. Everyone. See you. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.